you should get prompted, I hope. <clears throat> I don't know if that's working. Oh, it looks like it is. Okay. So with that, I'll say welcome to Wolf Country Wednesday. I appreciate everyone being here. Uh, it is part of the Sierra Club Wisconsin Chapters Wolf Awareness Week. My name's Amy Mueller. I'm a part of our wildlife team that hosts this event. This is our third year putting it on. And we've gotten a really good response and it's, it's exciting to see the uh, openness to wanting to learn more about wolves. And that's what we're gonna be doing tonight. Um, we have a really interesting presentation, sort of a dual perspective of living with wolves. So we'll be talking about conflict mitigation and things that we do when wolves are a little bit of a problem on the landscape. And we're gonna talk about how we can prevent some of those things and how Mary Falk, our, our second presenter, is is learning to coexist with wolves as a farmer. So kind of a really interesting dynamic. Um, before we get into anything further, I've got just a couple of housekeeping items. You know it was time coming first. Our best effort, but if you can, I appreciate everybody's effort to stay on mute because um, we are recording this. Uh, we also are planning a good amount of time for Q&A at the end. So if you can, we're going to listen to our first uh, two presenters and then we'll get to Q&A. So please try to hold on to your questions till the end. I appreciate that. And um, following the presentation, we will be able to share the recorded link out. Uh, it's going to be hosted on our Sierra Club Wisconsin's YouTube channel. So with that, uh, as we begin, uh, the Sierra Club Wisconsin chapter has the privilege and responsibility to acknowledge the indigenous people who have called this land home for generations. This acknowledgement demonstrates our strong commitment and to collaborate and partner with the sovereign tribal nations located in Wisconsin. There are now 12 tribal nations that call this land home, 11 of which are federally recognized. No matter where you are in the state, you are on the ancestral land of a tribal nation. I will share the names of the people who uh, were first to live, celebrate and sing upon the land where I am currently joining you from in Western Waukesha County. That would be the Potawatomi, the Ho-Chunk, Miami, Sioux, Sock and Fox, Kickapoo and Peoria. The Sierra Club of Wisconsin reminds each of us to take the opportunity to learn about and appreciate the history of the land where we are and the great historical present and future contributions of indigenous people. It is also my pleasure to introduce the presenters this evening. So like I mentioned, our game plan is going to be that we look at these two perspectives. First, we're gonna have Brad Cooley from Wisconsin DNR, and then that's gonna be followed immediately by Mary Folk who runs Love Tree Farmstead Cheese. After we hear from both, then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, so with that, let's get things rolling. Uh, I'd like to introduce Brad. He is the wildlife damage specialist for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources or WDNR. Uh, he's held this position since 2007. With the delisting of wolves in 2012, Brad took over administration of the DNR's wolf damage compensation program. And he continues to oversee that today. Brad began his career with the DNR in 2001 after graduating the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, go pointers, uh, with a degree in natural resource management. He has several position has held several positions within the DNR, including the assistant project coordinator for Deer 2000, the big game program assistant, and the wildlife damage specialist. Tonight, he's going to give us an overview of the non-lethal methods being implemented at wolf conflict sites. I'll also add personally, Brad is one of my favorite WDNR employees. He's responsive, he gets it, he tells it like it is. He uh, is always very kind in answering all of my questions of which there have been many over the years. And um, he's a really valuable, just a really valuable resource uh, to anyone looking to learn more about these things. So certainly needless to say, I'm a big fan, appreciate him taking the time out of his busy schedule tonight uh, to, to share with us. So with that, Brad, I'll hand it over to you. 
All right. Thanks, Amy. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm here tonight to give you an overview of the efforts that we're undertaking to try to reduce and minimize the conflicts that we're seeing with wolves, um, primarily with livestock. So I'll share my screen here. I do have a presentation to, to share. So let me know when you can see that. I can see it, Brad. Looks good. I don't know if you want to put it in presentation mode, but you can see it. Yeah. All right, is it in presentation mode now? Uh, not yet. Can you see that, Amy? Uh, no, not yet. Sorry, folks. Let's try this again. <laughs> okay. Third time's the charm. And I'm just uh, admitting all kinds of people, so this is perfect timing, so don't worry. There it goes. Looks good. All right. Perfect. So, yeah, uh, my name is Brad Cooley, as Amy said, so I'll Wildlife Damage Special with DNR and give you an overview of our, our wildlife conflict program or wolf conflict program. Um, so our conflict program, our wolf conflict program, is a, um, a cooperative program. Uh, we partner with USDA Wildlife Services. So we have a cooperative service agreement with them. And what they provide is I think we might have lost the presentation there, Brad. Oh, and, we, and you got muted somehow. Yeah, for some reason I keep getting bounced out. Let's try sharing this one more time here. Okay. There you go. All right, let's try this. Okay. <laughs> so it's a, a cooperative agreement. So we, um, D DNR, we basically send all our... Oh, you still there, Amy? Yep. Yep. We just pause just for a second. Okay. <clears throat> we might have lost we might have lost Brad there for a second um apologies here hold on one second little technical difficulty never see if Brad's going to bounce back here for us. I apologize, folks. Otherwise, we might just end up flipping our presentation. <laughs> um, let's see. What happened to Brad? I'm guessing he's just trying to log back in here for us. All right, well, let's see here. While he's doing that, this is just, you know, the, the benefit of a live Zoom thing. Uh, why don't we do this? I'm going to bounce to, let's talk to Mary first. Mary's here, okay. she's, she's on, so let's let's roll the dice there. Um, so let me tell you about Mary. So Mary is uh, joining us from Love Tree Farmstead Cheese. She is um, from the late trade lake area of like Northwestern Wisconsin up in Burnett County. And um, it's sort of on the edge of the farming community while kind of on the edge of all things wild. And it's a very common occurrence for her to observe bald eagles and osprey and um, along with the occasional black bear, timber wolf and even cougar. So to keep her livestock safe, Mary utilizes livestock guardian dogs which allow her livestock to graze securely without upsetting the natural orders of things around her. 
Um, I'll add personally, Mary keeps it real. She has a lot of experience doing this and she's been a great voice for finding ways to coexist. So um, I'm super excited that Mary's joining us tonight and we're, we're going with it. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Mary, and I'll pull up your slides here and uh, we can look at some of your beautiful farm and animal pictures. So let me get that going here. And hopefully I have uh, better luck than our poor friend Brad did with all of this. Okay, so hopefully everyone is seeing this. Um, let's pop into, see? I want to go here. There we go. I hope everybody is seeing that. And Mary, I'll let you take it away. All righty, thank you, Amy. Um, I'm just trying to get some, there we go. All right, uh, so we're gonna go, to, uh, well, first of all, I'm Mary Falk. We have, my husband and I own Love Tree Farmstead Cheese. Uh, we've been here since 1986 um, as, as Love Tree. My husband is born and raised in this area. I'm an import from California, so that's what he calls me. So um, anyhow, we love where we're at and we wanna keep it as good as we can. And uh, all this wi wildlife and everything that uh, we really um, rejoice in, we also attribute to our phenomenal water up here. So all of this kind of all peels, to, um, comes together to help protect our artesian springs and the great water that Burnett County has. So if we go to the first um, slide, we're going to, I'm just going to show you uh, a little bit of what we're trying to protect and what the wolf is part of. So if you can go to the first one, Amy. And by the way, you're going to see a little uh, thing that work away across the front. I had, I pulled this off of my work away site and I didn't realize I was bringing the watermark with it. So anyhow, that's the middle of our property. One of the part of our large ponds. We have a couple hundred acres and five acre pond, three acre pond, and another three acre pond. And then we share a little 20 acre lake in the back. So our whole property is, is basically a wildlife corridor that all ends up emptying into the St. Croix River. So um, what makes it as unique is that, um, if you can go to the next one, Amy, um, is that uh, we always get wildlife coming through the property. And as they come through, um, you know, the predators follow. So here you see one of the ponds in the springtime, or actually probably closer to the fall, a couple of our geese. We have trumpeters, swans, uh, sandhill cranes, um, blue herons. A lot of the great raptors are here too. So anyhow, this is what we just kind of, this is my backyard. This is, um, this is my excuse for not weeding my garden. This is where I really like to be. So if you can go to the next one, Amy. In the spring, this is one of the pastures that we graze the sheep on. See, my husband's here walking up the sheep up to the pasture. And when in the springtime, the before the, it really gets warm, the grass is growing really slow. Um, so we don't do uh, rotational grazing or anything like that. We just turn our sheep loose. Uh, they, they have been born and raised on the property, and it's called hefting. So rarely do they leave the property. It's every so often they do. But um, the guard dogs follow with the sheep. And you can see the two dogs behind Dave there in the photo. And they just kind of meander through the property until um, things really kick off for the growing season. And then we kind of lock them down in some electric netting. So if we can go to the next um, slide. And this gives you an idea of where they're grazing and all the opportunities for the wildlife to hide. And we have all these nooks and crannies all over the property. Predators love this area. But um, as long as they learn that um, it's a no-no to touch the sheep and the goats and the cows, uh, we get along just fine. And so we run the livestock guard dogs with the animals and they kind of act like um, traffic control. So if um, predators come through, they just remind them to keep moving. Keep moving, keep moving, go to the neighbor who doesn't have dogs, just keep moving, keep moving. 
And uh, we're really pretty uh, lucky uh, with coexisting. Uh, we've had packs of coyotes. Um, we had uh, one bitch coyote that for years, uh, you know, and it was generational. They, they, tr they know what their role in society is on the farm. And that is for mousing, rodents, rodent control, all that stuff. And my husband would be out uh, baling hay or raking hay. And this bitch would come out with her pups and they would jump the mice coming out of the windrow as he's <laughs> turning the windrow. And that's what she's supposed to be doing. And meanwhile, the sheep were grazing just five acres away and the guard dogs were, were cool because they, you know, they were upwind. They didn't smell the coyotes, but the coyotes were not bothering with the livestock. So we did not have an entrenched problem because the guard dogs had already let them know that this isn't cool. You just keep doing what you need to be doing. So it's a lot easier to prevent a problem than to stop an established problem. So let's go to the next one. There's a reason we graze all these things. This is the wildflowers in the refuge. And all this stuff that the animals are grazing um, are packed with flavor. And we're, what we're trying to do is bring the uh, flavor of the Northwoods to our customers through our cheese. And so between the the flowers and the grass and the shrubbery, um, it all get, creates these really crazy flavors, uh, which ends up uh, with us being known as the most consistently inconsistent cheesemakers probably in the United States. So why don't you go to the next one? And we'll look at the sheep and goats. So you see the goats up there with me, and we're I'll bring them into the back field with the sheep. And you can't see the cows, but the cows are there too. And while the sheep are out grazing the grass, the goats are um, yeah. eating the leaves on the trees and um, hopefully stripping the bark off of the buckthorn. They're really good at doing that. And that all creates some really lively peppery flavors in the cheese too. And then uh, I think the next uh, slide we'll see, you can see what a, one of our cows looks like. Let's go to the next slide. There we go. That uh, we graze um, our cows are um, uh, Scottish Highlander crossed with uh, Normandy, and they're really amazing temperament, and they're really tough cows. And we leave the horns on all of them because that's another way to help prevent predators. And it's also um, Dave and I are really squeamish about dehorning animals. We're just a bunch of pansies, but. They use their horns, and uh, not on us. They're really mellow, but um, they're out scrubbing through the because the the Scottish Highlander that's in them also makes them like to eat thistles and shrubbery. So they're out sourcing their food and flavors for our cheese, and we're really happy that they're here. So why don't we look at the next one? This is just an idea of what our cheese looks like. These are just some of our cheeses. We do some young pasteurized cheese. The little young goat cheese up there on top has is lightly dusted with goldenrod ash. And then below that is some of our raw milk cheeses, which are really packing the flavor from what the animals are grazing on. And top dressed with our raw honey. Yay. So now this picture is a little bit on the muddy looking side. It was a little hazy when we took the photograph. And Amy, is it possible to enlarge it from where you're at at all? Can you enlarge the photo at all? I think that's about as as big, big as, as I can it? make oh. it, yeah. Okay, there's um, a little white dot to the, there you go. If you put a little marker on there, the little white dot, that's kind of, I don't know, on my screen, it's hard to see the depth of the picture, but it's rolling hills and trees in between everything there. And that little white dot is the top of the roof of the shelter for where our guardian dog pups are. And they're down in the middle of the refuge guarding the sheep right now. So our, our next photo, if we go to that, you'll show you the guard dog pups. We get, just have two new pups that came in this year. We bred them for over 20 years, but our um, our genetics kind of tapered out. So Howling for Wolves actually put up some money and brought us in 
two pups that are half Karakachan and half Italian Marema, which will dovetail beautifully with our our lifestyle uh, with our breeding program. So this is little Maureen, and um, she's only five months old. And look how intense she is. She's just such a serious little puppy. And then we can go to the next photo. And that's Maureen's on the um, the right, and her brother Roman is on the far left. And Patty Duke, this Patty Duke, is our, the matriarch behind them, and the sheep behind her. And Patty Duke's job right now is keeping those pups safe, because they're just going on six months old. And even though they think they weigh 500 pounds and they're tough, you know, they're still you know uh, predator bait if if they were left unprotected. So Patty's job is to keep them in line, teach them the ropes, and to keep them safe. And she does an amazing job. And um, her name, by the way, comes from um, my nieces. We had a litter born in 2016, and they said, let's call the theme for this letter the Dead Celebrities of 2016. So. That's Patty Duke, <laughs> and then we had Debbie Reynolds and all those good guys. So anyhow, these, these animals, we could not be farming without them. So let's go to the next one. And here's a couple of their predecessors out in the shrubbery with the sheep. And that's what they do. They sleep with the sheep, eat with, well, they don't eat the grass, but we feed them out there with them. And uh, good luck trying to sneak up on those guys. But the the um, issue with uh, guard dogs, which a lot of people sit there and say, oh, they're not effective with the wolves. Um, the biggest issue is people don't run enough dogs and they don't run them properly, properly according to my standards. Um, that's one thing I learned. Uh, I went to Spain to visit shepherds out there, and uh, they ran dogs as a pack. And here, everybody was cordoning off the dogs in separate paddocks. And, um, you know, hello, the predators don't, you know, hunt alone. The dogs can't protect alone. So we run our own packs of dogs. So all of our dogs, um, except for Patty Duke right now, because we need her in with those pups, they all run loose on the property. So it gives them the freedom to cover property quickly and to deter, you know, predators that are coming through. Go to the next one. And this is just a photo. I had to get that of my husband in there. He's taking the goats out for a goat walk. And if in the foreground, you can see the back end of Tony, that's the buck <clears throat> and the set of horns on him. And um, if, if he was to be challenged by a predator, he'd at least have a little bit of a shot. But, yeah, it's, it's more for top dress than anything else. But um, Dave's just getting them out to the to where they go, they're going to graze for the day. And then they come in at night, um, not because they couldn't stay out at night, but um, they're buggers and they're really hard to maintain. Um so we found that we could lock them up better at night. We know where they're at. Otherwise, they end up on our front porch every morning because they want to be with Dave. So the goats are like dogs. Okay, so the next one. And these are uh, the dogs up in front. Those two dogs are two of our dogs, but they're, this is at my friend's house, house her, her property. And she's out. Um, she kind of uh, grazes like we do. She turns the sheep loose and lets the dogs do their thing. Um, and when I say that, I also want people to realize that whatever we do, we do with uh, the intention of what is nesting at, and at what time of the year it is. Because um, the woods are really important to us and the marshes. Because this, this whole, it's all about, you know, biodiversity on our farm. Okay, let's go to the next one. Oh, and this is puppy love. <laughs> this is one of our litters of puppies. And one of our cheese customers came up and she just wanted to get some puppy kisses. And 
boy, she got mauled. <laughs> the guard dogs love people within the family. I mean, you, you need to socialize them. If they're not socialized, you know, you're going to create a problem like any animal. But our guard dogs, you can put babies with them. Um, but if we're not here, you can't get out of your pickup truck. So they, they're very discerning animals. They're very intuitive. They know how to read body language. And they're very, very um, oh, in love with, with uh, children, especially. Let's do the, do the next one. And in the wintertime, <clears throat> our dogs will not tolerate their shelter. They don't like it. What they love is big round bales of hay. And we bring the livestock up towards the barn in the wintertime because that's where all the feed is. And um, this is kind of like a Where's Waldo photo because you can, if you're really perceptive and if the lighting is good, you can see maybe five dogs. If you know where to look, you see six. And there's actually eight dogs in that bale of hay. So once we lost time, one of our bitches took off and she was supposed to be having a litter of pups and we were trying to get a hold of her to get her kenneled up so that we could, it was the middle of the winter time and it was 25 below zero, but she slipped out of the kennel and my son found her in the backfield because he looked out there and saw this big round bale of hay and steam rising out of the top of it. And he went to the bale and she had dug down into the middle of the bale and had had her puppies in the middle of the bale and they were all toasty warm. But, you know, she was a little irritated that we had removed all the puppies from there. But she's very resourceful. And then uh, I guess our last slide is coming home. <clears throat> this is me. I, I took this photo coming home from the farmer's market one day, driving up the driveway. You can see my cows off to the left there. And it was, you know, just one of those little signs of, yeah, this makes it all worthwhile. This is worth protecting. And um, so this is, I'm showing you what um, we're protecting and uh, the terrain that we have. You can see all these places for critters to hide. And saying all that, you know, we've been doing this since 1986. And we've never had to shoot, trap, or snare, or kill any predator yet. So um, I, I don't really, you know, I have a hard time when people sit there and tell me dogs don't work or things like that. Um, there was a time when we had a lot more uh, livestock, so we had more dogs, and we added llamas, because the llamas were great sentries. Uh, they could see a lot further and help the dogs, uh, give them a heads up that something's headed their way before the dogs could wind it. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to work different, you know, different issues. Uh, but we're pretty loosey-goosey on the way we graze. Uh, right now, they're tightened up because we're trying to get every morsel we can efficiently off the off the farm. But um, other than that, uh, you know, we probably, if anybody's given predators a chance to have fun, it's us. But the dogs say, you know, we'll take care of it. So uh, yesterday, my son's trail cam picked up... Um, uh, just 50 yards south of those pups that you saw, a bear was right there, uh, a big bear, and he was uh, cruising through. And then my um, our other friend has a trail cam on our property. We have some young men that like to deer hunt, so they're getting ready for deer hunting season. And um, he, they picked up seven coyotes going between the two ponds last night. So, you know, we have a lot of uh, predator activity right now. So, um, but it's, I guess that's actually kind of that way all the time. We just don't always have all the cameras up. So anyhow, um, I know there's, there's questions that people are going to want to ask and I don't want to keep repeating myself. No, but, no uh, you're that. I have a million questions <laughs> now. Like okay. I, I, I want to dig into this, but I want to give Brad his chance yes. yet again. Yes. Back. I know. So, um, let's put a pause on that and then we'll come back yep. and you some questions but thank you those are beautiful photos thank you for sharing and well i'm just glad that brad is able to click back in <laughs> yeah, we, got, we got brad back and thank you for jumping in i said um you know before we let everyone in i said this is going to be fluid and it's you know best effort so let's thank you so much for being flexible and uh let's see brad i i, I want to say 
I'm going to give you a shot. Let's see. What do you think about sharing your screen again? Yeah, yeah. let's let's try it. Let's see what happens okay. here. So let me know when you can see that. Okay. It is you're sharing your screen, but I don't see the PowerPoint quite yet. That's weird. Yeah, I don't. There it is. There it is. There we go. All right. Let's see if this works here. <laughs> all right. Fingers crossed. It's all yours, Brad. Thank you again. You bet. So yeah, so not quite sure where we ended last time, but um, yeah, we, we try to education is our, our primary abatement, you know, so we, we have um, on the DNR's website, hopefully folks have had an opportunity to see that. We have a interactive mapping application on there that shows all the locations of verified conflicts. Um, we create caution areas when there's hunting dog and pet depredations to alert, you know, people that might be utilizing public lands. Uh, we have a variety of brochures. Um, folks that are interested, we do have a gov delivery system that sends email and text alerts to individuals that subscribe. We have two different subscription lists. One is for hunting dog depredations, um, and the other one is for livestock or even human health and safety conflicts. So, um, yeah, we try to <coughs> utilize education as a, as a way to inform people or, or make people aware of where conflicts occur and, and hope that they take, you know, precautions when they're recreating in those. Oh no, Brad, we, we lost it again. That's so strange. Um, oh, are you there again? Can you hear me? There you go. Can you see the, still see it? You can't see the PowerPoint. <laughs> oh, I don't know what's cooking. I don't either. What's going on here? Um, another tool we use is called Fox Lights. Um, hopefully it'll pop up on the screen here for you in a minute. But um, another tool we use is Fox Lights. It's basically a visual deterrent. Um, it's a kind of a strobe light. It has red, blue, and uh, white colored flashing lights. You put them on the top of T posts or, or the fence posts and it's a visual deterrent. Um, again, it's a, a stimuli that wolves are not used to. Um, you know, some little I'm back. Can you hear? <laughs> there you go. He's back. <laughs> oh my goodness. I don't know I what's going on. I was like, I, I, I wasn't even touching my computer that time because I was worried. I'm like, it, is something how I'm having some bad juju here, but um, let's, I, I, let's keep going. Let's just see what we can do here. <laughs> Otherwise you can send me the presentation and I can try to bring it up if that would be helpful. Yeah, we can try that. Uh, let me pull it up here quick. And we can, that's just one other way to try it if we get stuck. Yeah. And it probably won't happen again if you send it to me. That's just how it goes. All right, I wonder, did we lose Brad completely? Yep, I think we lost Brad completely again. Okay, I'm so sorry, everybody. That's just how these things go. Um, I'm sure he's going to get me the presentation via email, so I will wait to get that and pop that up, um, and we'll we'll try to get him back here as quickly as we can. Um, on the flip side, just to keep things moving, if you have some uh, top of mind questions for Mary, if you want to go ahead and put those in the chat, that way we can kind of get that ready to roll. So let's see here. I'm going to quick just check my email from brad and then uh, i'll get some questions going in the uh in the chat
I, I saw a question that came up about how many dogs we're currently using. Yeah, please go ahead, Mary. I, I don't see anything from Brad yet. So I, we were having some major technical issues, unfortunately, with him. So go ahead and start answering sure. some of those questions. Um, we, um, we're, we're short on dogs right now. That's why actually Howling for Wolves uh, uh, su subsidized us and helped us bring in the two new breeding dogs. I had to um, spay Miss Patty Duke, which is my best breeding girl, because she kept having a heat cycle every two months. So we're down to five dogs right now, including the pups, which makes us really nervous because we typically run eight dogs here. So um, we're hoping that we can keep things mellow, you know, during this next um, couple of years until the pups are ready. So what that what that means is that we have to be more observant and tighten up the, the grazing and be just more aware, especially during uh, a lot of predator times. My, my sons um, have put up, I think we have eight trail cams now on the property. So that also helps give us some um, information of what's happening. And, and what I didn't say before is, um, I have one son that bow hunts a lot, and that's well, that's his excuse for standing in a tree, I think, because he doesn't get that much. He just, he loves the wildlife. And he's watched wolves go under his his stand and bear all in the same day. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy, but it works. So. Well, there's a couple more, uh, Mary. There's, uh, you know, is it expensive to have guard dogs? You know, obviously... <laughs> Well, farm and bottom uh, lines are always a factor. We, we make our own dog food. It's kind of like slopping pigs. I learned that in Spain. Um, they uh, Nobody feeds commercial dog food because the dogs don't live that long. Um, our dogs live to be about 14 years old. And in Spain, the Great Danes live to be about that age. And it's basically all about, um, it's like... A, we feed around a 25% protein that's ground raw grain. And then we, we're cheese makers, so we throw in raw milk with it. And then eggs when they're available. And during hunting season, they get bones and raw fat to take them through the winter. And um, where you have livestock, you also tend to get dead stock. So that also ends up being dog food. And uh, the dogs do well. They do, do well on that. And um, with making our own dog food, it is, I ran the numbers and it's about uh, cheaper than feeding if we were to feed Walmart's Old Roy, which is like the bottom line of all dog food. So, and the dogs stay really nice and healthy with nice clean teeth. But uh, the vet care is, is a, a, a challenge. So our goal is to keep the dogs as healthy as possible, so. Um. What, another question is just, can you elaborate on what it means to run run dogs? I'm assuming that just means the oh. guard dogs are out, but... We, we run a pack of dogs. They're out, they're literally running loose. Our dogs are not confined. They're not chained. Um, uh, they're, like, the pups are confined right now because they're in training and we're protecting them. And then, uh, otherwise, all the dogs run loose, um, which is a challenge because we have a county road that separates through the middle of our property. So our dogs also have to learn how to cross the road without getting hit by a car. And they're very good about that. Um, they also cross the, we cross sheep across the road and the dogs, it's, it's really actually comical. People try, there's always somebody that doesn't want to wait for the sheep to cross and they try to push their car through. And we've had that a few times and the dogs literally go after the bumper of the car. So um, I'm, I'm in the back and going, yeah. Yeah, so, but anyhow, um, the dogs are very perceptive. They um, they just know what they're supposed to do. They're, it's, you know, they've been bred for over 5,000 years to do this. So our job is to give them the proper environment to do it. And we don't have any perimeter fencing. So, um, like I said, we're pretty loosey-goosey, but um, it's all about the breeding of the dogs. And we've selected breeds that stay tight to the property and to the livestock. Um, like we could never do this with Great Pyrenees because it's not their character. They are bred to roam, and that's what they're supposed to do. Um, they they go out in like a circle. They clear out the predators within a tight circle, and once they get the predators out of that area, they enlarge their circle until they're almost five miles out. Um, which obviously in the Lakes District doesn't bode well with all the cabin owners, so we don't do that. But, you know, they do pretty well up in Montana and places that are more open range. 
So, and just to clarify, the breed of dogs uh, that you use specifically. The breed of dogs are our original core breeds are the Italian Maremma, which is a very tight guarding dog, uh, stays tight to the livestock and the property. Um, the Spanish Ranch Mastiff, which also does that. Uh, they cover a little bit more property faster. They're a bigger dog. And uh, the Polish Tatra, which is the more rare dog. They're they're kind of like a larger version of the Italian Maremma. And the, um, genetics are tight to come by in the United States. And we originally went to Spain to bring back the Spanish Ranch Mastiffs. And now they changed the import rules where it's difficult to bring back a dog that's less than six months old. And that's really hard on guard dogs to move them at that age. They, they move better when they're smaller puppies. So that's why we went down to Iowa and visited Stephanie Mitchum, who has Italian Maremmas crossed to Karakachan. And they are from Bulgaria. And they're very similar in style to uh, guarding as the Spanish Ranch Mastiff. So um, from what we've seen so far, we really like what we're seeing. And we're hoping to take our stud male and cross to one of those pups, you know, at a later date. So. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to pause there. I think we got a couple of good questions out of the way with Mary. I, do we roll I, the I, dice? I see what Brad in, in the, in the tile up there. So I'm hoping yeah. he's back. Do so. we, Brad, do you want to just talk through things? or? Yeah, you, let's, let's just talk through it. I, yeah. I'm, I'm not very we confident. Can send it out after if that's <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. It's, it's a huge PowerPoint because of all the pictures. So maybe that's what's happening, but, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll uh, just kind of verbally tell everyone, I wish I could show these pictures because you know, obviously the pictures kind of provide some <coughs> perspective, but um, yeah, there's a number of non-lethal tools that, that we use. Um, so what I'm talking about, you know, is, is stuff that's implemented by DNR and wildlife services, you know, imp implemented by the agencies, you know, producers, a lot of producers do their own um, type of abatement, like Mary, you know, some have guard dogs, um, you know, some, you know, will abandon pastures if there's depredation, some will try night penning, you know, so there's a number of non-lethal things that producers do themselves, you know, to prevent conflicts or, or reduce conflicts. Um, so one of the tools that we use is fox lights. Um, you know, it's just a, a flashing strobe light, red, blue, uh, white colored lights. And, you know, it's a visual deterrent. It's something different that the wolves may not be used to. You know, you put it on the T post or the end of the fence post around the perimeter of the pasture at a number of locations. And again, it's, it's uh, something that the wolves are not used to and, and, you know, provides that visual deterrent. Um, they are temporary, um, you know, so wolves do become habituated to them. We have had depredations that occur inside those fox lights, but they are, um, you know, a, a good tool that we can use, especially on those farms that do not have chronic wolf issues or, or that might for the first time have a wolf conflict. Um, and they cost about $110 each. So it's a fairly low cost uh, abatement that we can um, try to utilize on, on a particular farm. Um, one other abatement that we use pretty commonly and, and a lot of folks have probably heard of it is flagry or turbo flagry. Um, it's basically electrified turbo flagry is electrified wire with red flags that hang off of it. And, and many people think that it's electrified and, and that's what the deterrent is, but it's not. The, the electrification is actually for the cattle. Um, most cases, cattle will, will lick or, or they'll you know touch the, the fencing. So the electric, electrification is to keep the cattle off the fence. And, and what that does is that allows us to put that flagery inside um, the perimeter of the pasture, you know, so you're not dealing with vegetation, um, you know, fence lines, brush, stuff like that. So it allows us to, to put that flagery inside. Um, but then it's a visual deterrent. And that's what it is for the wolves. You know, the wolves see those flags hanging down and, and they're flapping in the wind, things like that. And, and, you know, again, it's something that wolves are not used to and, and um, you know, a visual deterrent form. A lot of cases, you know, we have solar power defensors or energizers that we power them with, you know, so we can put them way back in a pasture and, and you know, not have to worry about electric issues or, you know, making sure that there's power there because we can do it through solar, solar energizers. Uh, the cost has really gone up. There's only one supplier that we're aware of um, that provides the, the turbo flagery. And currently the cost is roughly $3,700 per mile. And it's not uncommon for us to have, you know, three, four miles of, of flagery out, you know, at several different locations across the north. So um, it use, use, uh, we use it fairly commonly. Again, you know, it's designed as a temporary abatement, you know, several months, you know, especially when animals are calving, the majority of depredations occur when, 
when, um, you know, uh, producers are calving and, and those calves are, are small and vulnerable, you know, typically when an animal gets four or five, six months, it gets a lot larger and, and typically it's not as susceptible to depredation. Um, but yeah, so we put Fladry out on the landscape, which is, is pretty common. Um, I do have some cool pictures of, of wolves interacting with Fladry and stuff in my PowerPoint, but unfortunately I can't show that to you. Um, but it is a, a good tool that we use uh, fairly commonly. Um, another one that we use is, um, it's, uh, we call them scare radios, which is basically a, a weather radio that we put out in the middle of a pasture. Um, we actually worked with a company out of Superior, Wisconsin. Um, so we, uh, Wildlife Services actually designed one of these scare radios themselves, had one of their specialists that was, um, you know, pretty tech savvy and, and able to work with electronics and, and they built a prototype, but then um, took it to this company out of Superior, Wisconsin. And, and like I said, it's, it's a radio inside a weatherproof box and it's programmed to, to play at different intervals, you know, throughout the night and play talk radio or music. And again, it's an audio deterrent, you know, something that the wolves are not used to uh, simulates, you know, people or human activity out in that pasture. Um, and, and again, is, is a deterrent. We have some producers that love, um, you know, um, request the, the scare radios because they feel it, it works very well. Um, we also can power those with solar powered fencers um, or, or solar uh, panels. So um, they're hooked to a battery system. Uh, some locations will mount them to a fence post or a tree. Other locations will put them on, a, on a, a trailer and we can move those around the pasture so the wolves don't become so habituated to that noise coming from one spot. You know, we move it around and it, you know, it, it obviously is, is a different impact. Um, so that's, that's common. Uh, those costs right around a thousand dollars a piece. Um, you know, so a little bit more costly, but they are, um, you know, another tool that we use. And again, they're, they're designed to be temporary. You know, you, you, you can't utilize them all the time because otherwise wolves, you know, they're smart. They'll, they'll come uh, habituated to it or accustomed to hearing that sound and, and it won't be as effective. So again, a, a temporary abatement technique that we use. Um, we did several years ago, we had um, a, a a specialist from Natural Resource Defense Council come out and, and we took uh, her around, um, Wildlife Services and I took her on one day and demonstrated all these non-lethal abatement techniques. And um, the only reason I bring that up is I have a photo with her looking at one of these scare radios. And, and um, ultimately it, it, um, they lobbied Congress and were able to get a bunch of non-lethal funding, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, one other tool that we use is, is a called scare wire. And basically it's electrified wire that goes roughly eight to 10 inches above the bottom of the ground. And that's electrified as well. It can either be um, poly tape. Poly tape provides more of a visual deterrent that the wolves can see. Um, the problem with poly tape is that it's not very durable. Um, a lot of times it'll flap in the wind. And of course, when it flaps in the wind, um, the, the metal wires inside break down and, and end up breaking and then you lose connectivity and, and you know it, it shorts out. Um, the other option is a you know a smooth uh, wire that that uh, um, most electric fences use. Um, we did have a farm in Burnett County where we where we had um, a little over seven miles of scare wire that we put on, on one farm there. Um, we had that out for why probably six years um, and, and it cut down on depredations. It didn't totally eliminate it, but it did cut down on the depredations on that farm. Um, the other thing to think about anytime you're using flagery or, or electric fencing is, um, you know, vegetation. So, uh, um, you know, we had a technician that went out there weekly to, to make sure that, you know, uh, we had good connectivity and, and good voltage going through that fence every week. And then, um, of course, do vegetative management, whether that was spraying or weed whipping, you know, to, to make sure that fence was working in, in, in good c condition. Um, so scare wire is, is a, another tool that we use. Um, several years ago in, in 2016, we partnered with um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, Fish and Wildlife Service and USDA Wildlife Services, um, and we put um, improved the producer's fencing around his um, cattle operation, a big cow calf operation up in Douglas County. He had an existing three strand electric fence, um, and we improved that uh, with the funding that we received, we improved that to a six strand electric fence. So it was alternated um, hot 
uh, uh, ground, hot ground, hot ground. Um, that fence worked really well. It was 4.2 miles in, in total length. Um, I was out there wrapping uh, stays and, and, and energizers and stuff myself. It was a great collaborative effort. Um, you know, and, and that fence has worked pretty well. Again, it hasn't been 100% um, foolproof. Um, we have had wolves inside and depredations inside, but for the most part, it's really cut down on the amount of conflicts that he's receiving. And what he does is he, he makes sure that when he's calving in the springtime, he calves within that, that fence, you know, because that provides him the best protection. And then once those animals get a little bit bigger, then he can move them out to a different pasture and, and graze them like he normally would. Um, we have had to make adjustments to that fence. So it's, it's up in the clay plains up in Douglas County. And of course, those soils up there like to shrink and swell. And, and typically, when you think of that, you think of, of the soil pushing those fence posts out, but it actually did the opposite. It pulled those fence posts down. So that bottom wire was shorting out so we ended up having to, to make that bottom wire a ground and then the next wire up we we made a, a live wire and hot you know so we've had to make adjustments there um another one that we've gone to is um in, in recent years here the last several years is a the six uh, foot high woven wire fence with a 42 inch apron we call it our, our permanent um predator proof fencing uh, it's fairly costly we we've built uh, one several years ago in, in uh, Price County on that same farm. We upgraded another pasture to that fencing last year. Um, this year we, we built uh, a similar type fence around a, a huge operation in um, just south of Five Field. And currently we have right now we have three projects underway, two in, in Bayfield County and one in Douglas County. So it's a six foot high woven wire fence, 42 inch apron um, to prevent dig unders. Um, you know, those right now, the ones that we just bid out are eight to $9 a linear foot, but those have been, you know, like I said, we've had them on the landscape for several years now and they've been hundred percent effective. We have not had any breaches. Um, the one that we put up or the two fences that we put up in Price County were around a, a sheep ranch. Um, the individual had some pretty horrific depredation events in, in, in the past. You know, one depredation event, there was almost 40 um, ewes and, and lambs that were killed in one depredation event. You know, some pretty um, bad wolf issues there. They did have a couple uh, livestock guard dogs that were also depredated by wolves on that same farm. But since we've had these fences up, they have not had a single depredation event. Um, so these fences do appear to be... Um, you know, um, probably the gold standard and, and you know, what, what we want to go to for some of these chronic sites, but they are costly, like I said, eight to $9 a linear foot. Um, you know, so cost is a, a little bit of prohibitive um, depending on what pastures you're looking at. Um, another one that I do want to just mention that we've attempted this year are two different ones that we've attempted this year is a, a range riding um, type situation. So out west, they use range riding on horses and things like that. Um, on some of our chronic farms this year, um, or one of our chronic farms this year, we've tried range riding at night with ATVs. So basically, we have a technician that goes out there um, a couple nights a week at least and, and rides an ATV around the past year just to have that human presence there. Um, mixed results at this point, we've had wolves, wolves on camera. Um, trail camera um, on that farm um, on a particular night and, and a little bit later uh, that gentleman was there doing a range riding and, and we did not have any depredation events so um, not to say that those wolves will have depredated anyway but you know it does or it's not or, uh, feasible to say that maybe that range riding did prevent a depredation that night. We don't exactly know, but we are going to continue to do it. Um, the downside is, is it's costly. You know, there's a lot of administrative time to do it. And, um, you know, right now we're only able to do it intermittently. We can't do it every night, you know, have that presence there every night because of the, the cost, administrative costs. Um, the other thing that I do want to mention too, is we're always exploring, you know, new methods, what, what we can do to prevent depredations. Uh, one of the things we tried earlier this spring was motion activated lights or, or, or ear tags. So basically we, we tagged approximately 40 calves in, in Russ County um, with these um, lights that are activated with motion. So once a calf starts running, the lights flicker, you know, and, and again, it's supposed to be a visual deterrent um, that once a wolf see that, that light stimuli, you know, it's, it's supposed to hopefully 
you know, quit them and, or, or stop in them in the act of depredating. Um, those did not work. Um, the, a lot of the, the lights fell off the ear tags. Um, however, we are still working with the National Wildlife Research Center, that's USDA Wildlife Services Research Branch, um, on different designs to see if maybe that is a, a abatement method that we can use in the future. Um, so we're always, always looking, um, you know, to, to find different tools that we can utilize. I just want to touch on funding short um, here quickly. So we have basically two funding sources that we utilize. Unfortunately, you know, the funding sources that are provided through the state are mainly geared towards compensation. Um, so we're, we're always looking for funding sources to, to try to, um, you know, put towards non-lethal abatements. And there's uh, two things one I, I kind of hit on a little bit earlier, but Congress uh, several years ago uh, created a, a non-lethal carnivore um, earmark or, or um, you know, funding source. So um, initially when that, that was created in fiscal year 2020, there was a $1.38 million allocation nationwide, um, you know, nationwide allocated to that, to non-lethal carnivore um, conflict management. Um, fiscal year 23, that's been increased to 4.5 million. So a lot more money out there being um, earmarked for non-lethal carnivore management or, or conflict management. Uh, beaver were added to that as well. But here in Wisconsin, last year, we got $200,000. So a, a pretty good pot of money. And um, again, we've used that to hire a range rider or a, um, actually a non-lethal technician that implements a lot of the non-lethal, including the range rider. Um, we've used it for non-lethal uh, beaver management as well um, with flow devices and things like that. So that's one sort of uh, pot of money that we have. You know, the downside is, you never know how long Congress is going to allocate that funding, you know, but at least we have it right now and we can utilize that for a lot of these non-lethal uh, techniques. Um, the other pot of money is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Livestock Demonstration Grant. It's been a grant program that's been around for years. We, DNR, we apply for um, um, compensation funding. And then the other part of that grant is for non-lethal um, abatement. And uh, last year we received $60,000 and this year we received um, sorry, last year we received 30,000 and this year we received 52,000 and that grant has to be matched by the state. So um, in total last year we had 60,000 and this year 104,000 and we wrote those grants specific to the um, predator proof fencing that I described earlier. So we're using that funding to try to address some of these um, farms that have chronic wolf issues and, and looking for long term solutions there. Um, so again, just wanted to point out those tools that we are using. I wish my PowerPoint worked so I could show you some of the visual images of, of what's being put out on the landscape, but that's a, um, you know, a short summary of, of what we're working on. Okay, great. No, and I'm happy to share that PowerPoint out afterward. You know, we can, we'll get to see the pictures and I, it is cool to see the light up tags. I'm disappointed to hear that they didn't hang on, hang in there the way, you know, we kind of had hoped, but um, I thank you for running through all that so quickly and giving us so much information. I took a page of notes and you know that I talk to you pretty often. So thank you for that. I mean, it is good to know. And I will admit that uh, I was raised with horses and I too know that you can't have anything hitting those electric lines. And, you know, I can appreciate that it is a fair amount of maintenance too for, for farmers to take on. So it was a good moment for me to kind of pause on that. Um, but I appreciate all the, the different things. I know um, this is sort of an emerging thing that we're learning. And certainly I think the important thing with non-lethal is just what you touched on, Brad, where, you know, you can't put up one thing and walk away. Um, and I think sometimes the idea is, well, if I put up flaggery, check the box, right? Um, I, I've done it. And so I think it's important to, there's got to be, you got to mix it up. It's just like whether it's a wolf or my pet corgi, eventually they would get desensitized to something that's always the same on the landscape. So it's it's sort of this evolving science that you're always playing with what's going to work. And um I appreciate you saying that that predator proof fence is kind of the gold standard. That's helpful to know. Um, so it just sounds like we need to work on trying to get you some funding to get those put in. Um, yeah. Yeah. Those fences have been great. Like I said, we have three projects that are underway right now and will be completed sometime in November, you know, so it, it provides a lot of peace of mind for those producers that have, you know, dealt with wolf, wolf conflicts for, for a number of years, you know, it, it um, yeah, gives them, you know, peace of mind that, that their animals are safe within that fence. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, 
thank you. I know we are at time, but I, and I promised to land this thing, but here's what I'm going to do. I'd like to just extend if I can, if you're able to stay on with us, certainly appreciate it. I'd like to be able to give Brad a few minutes here to field a few questions. If you have them, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, if you have to go, we certainly understand and we can share some of these questions. If you have them, um, please put them in the chat. If we don't get to them in the next few minutes, I will uh, follow up with Brad and share that out. So it looks like we've got a couple questions here, Brad, and I'll just read them off for you. We've got, um, why aren't more farmers who are having conflicts utilizing these tools? What are some of the challenges you run in the field? Yeah, I, I think some of it's probably the cost and, and maintenance. Um, you know, like I said, the you know the fox lights, things like that, are, are pretty low cost. You know, um, but like the electric fencing, you know, it it does have a lot of administrative time putting it up and maintaining it. You know, anytime we put up, you know, turbo flagry or even even the scare wire stuff like that, we are out there every week. Um, a wildlife services specialist you know, um, checking to make sure that that fence is, is operating correctly, you know, going out there with voltage meters to make sure it's not shorting out um, the flagery. Sometimes the, those flags will wrap around the wire. So they're un, unwrapping those to make sure that they're, they're flapping in the wind and visual. So I think it's, it's a combination of cost and then also the, the labor that is involved with maintaining it. I have heard that the time issue is, is always when you're on a farm, I get, I can appreciate that. Um, another question is, do you use multiple tools on one site? And I'll kind of add on to that. Is there sort of a systematic escalation that you use when you have these depredations or does it really depend on the site? Yeah, it depends on the site, but we do where we can. We try to utilize multiple techniques, you know, um, the, the one farm, even where we have the uh, um, permanent fence, um, you know, we do still have a scare radio there as well. Um, other farms, we've we've used fox lights in conjunction with turbo flagery, you know, so we do use multiple techniques. Um, that one farm that I showed you with the six strand electric fence, we also have, you know, some um, uh, scare radios on that farm. So yeah, we do use multiple techniques. You know, the difficult or, or trouble is that, you know, you know um, wolves have seen that abatement for a number of years you know they're, they're used to it they're they're habituated to some of it so a lot of it is um, losing its effectiveness you know um, we had six seven farms this year where we've had um, non-lethal abatement implemented on that farm and we've had multiple depredations so yeah that that's the trouble is it's it's it does help but it's certainly not 100 percent effective Okay, and then a question from Carrie Behealer, who you may know, uh, retired from DNR. Um, she asks, is, is the non-lethal the first used or is that the go-to sort of solution? Is it, um, you know, is it the preventative or is it sort of the, the remedy after you have a depredation? Yeah, non-lethal is is our go-to. Um, you know, so if it's if it's a new farm where we haven't had any conflicts, you know, we always try to resolve it non-lethally. You know, that's the first thing we do. You know, whether you know it's fox lights or flagery or or you know something else. You know, we try to resolve it non-lethally. Now we have this dispensing tool where it's feasible. Um, you know, to try to utilize that when we have available funding. Um, but yeah, we always try to to use non non-lethal first. Um, you know, to to resolve conflicts. Conflicts. Um, when we do have management authority and, and there's been a number of depredations on a farm and non-lethal has failed, you know, then we will consider lethal control, but we always, um, always use non-lethal before we jump to that lethal control option when, when we do have it. Cool. I appreciate you uh, clarifying that. And then um, I know that uh, obviously Mary was talking about her guardian livestock, um, livestock dogs. And I've heard that, you know, donkeys, or I think she said, uh, I, alpacas maybe or you know no, um, llamas llamas okay so i was close um do you have any opportunities to use those brad or is it more of like the what i'll kind of call like equipment or human involvement yeah so far it's been equipment so we did several years ago try to apply for some of the livestock grant funding to um do a, a guard dog project um, so we were, we were looking at doing that. We ultimately didn't get the funding um, for it, you know, so we have looked into some guard animal projects like that, but, um, you know, we, we didn't get the funding. So everything, at least at this point, has been more equipment type related. The, can I say something on, about donkeys and llamas? Um, some people that will, you know, a llama can be successful in a very low predator 
predator pressure area, like uh, occasional dogs or occasional coyotes. Um, but other than that, my experience has been that llamas and donkeys are prey for wolves. You know, it only takes two um, large wolves to bring down a bull elk, you know, and so it's, um, I, I hate to see people rely on something like that. We use the llamas as sentries. They were great notifiers to the dogs. So as a team effort, it was great. But um, I would never have relied on the llamas for the, the wolves or even a, a large pack of coyotes. Okay, yeah, so not alone. Okay, I appreciate that clarification. That's good. Um, uh, Brad, have you, I've got a question that came in. Do you have any experience or understanding? It sounds like some states maybe in the West are using drones. Uh, have Has there been any experimentation yet with that? We, we have not. So Wildlife Services, um, they are um, doing that out west and, and some of their technicians here are actually getting certified to use drones. Right now we're using them for crop damage assessments and things like that. But we have talked about, yeah, trying to use drones to, to haze wolves. Um, but to date, we have not used that here. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, it definitely is something that's just emerging and we keep learning with all the different technologies. So um, cool. That's, um, I've got a question for Mary that came in. Mary, have you ever had a depredation when you've had your dogs out? Uh, I had one depredation. It was about 10 years ago. Um, we had, it was a bad, uh, it was a weird combination of events. We had, our main dog was in the barn she had just had a litter of pups so we had her locked up and we just had two young uh, they were under two years old juveniles out in the uh, back field with a one flock of sheep we had at that time three different flocks split up on different parts of the farm and so we had split the dogs up because some of them were younger some were older whatever but meanwhile um our uh, young neighbor down the road decided he was going to go hunting and he shot this big old coyote bitch, which was, we recognized as the one on our property. He was so proud of that. He came over and showed us, look what I got. And he was just doing it for fun. And I went, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, and that's all hell broke loose within two weeks. And um, we didn't expect it to be that soon, but uh it was about six o'clock in the morning and we had the, uh, went out to check on the sheep and the two young uh, dogs had the sheep huddled in the far corner. There were two sheep that were down and they were a different breed than ours. They were Icelandic sheep, which um, we had um, been experimenting with. And by the way, they, they don't flock. So we always said they have a suicide complex because you know if you're not flocking, there's safety in numbers. And those two had been attacked. Uh, neither one were killed. Um, one we had to put down. Uh, and neither one were eaten on. And the dogs were exhausted because they were trying to keep those uh, from being um, mauled any further. And the neighbor had seen the pack of coyotes. And he cu counted nine coyotes that come in there and that were just right above our property. So it took us putting out all of our dogs. So we had seven dogs out there to hold that pack away from our sheep. And they still kept surrounding the property, harassing the, uh, the dogs until we finally, we, the joke was let loose the Kraken. And we had to go get Tuli out of the barn and say, come on, Tuli, time to get out there. And, and she had a total attitude. She was like, come on, knock it off my chip, the chip off my shoulder. I dare you, you know, and once we l let her loose, then they moved on. But that first night that we had those two sheep down, the neighbor down the road lost 10 and they had had just two dogs out. But um, so we don't know if it was the pack that the bitch coyote had been um, raising or if it was a new pack that had come in, because if you use a, the, a, a pack that has you know, user friendly. I mean, they, they understand their boundaries. They themselves keep out other packs because they're all territorial. So having lost her, everything was thrown to the wind. It took us over six months to get things back on track. So that was the only time we've had a depredation. So, um, 
thanks to my buddy down the road who thought he was really cool shooting the guy out. <laughs> so, I mean, d social dynamics are really wonky with, with these animals. I mean, it's, it's amazing what can happen with, if you just throw it off a bit. Well, I appreciate you sharing that story. I've heard you sort of re say that, but it's so you know interesting to hear how you know one thing can really upset what what had sort of normalized or had of sort of kind of um, right. sorted itself in terms of understanding. And when that goes out of uh, balance, what can happen? So I yeah, and and they're they're you know coyotes and wolves. They're all pack animals. They're all territorial, and that's why we we really appreciate the guard dogs because they speak the same language, you know, but. Yeah, we kind of got ourselves into a uh, situation because we weren't paying attention as closely as we should have. And we didn't realize our half of our dogs were getting as old as they did, you know. So we had a big turnover of dogs just from old age in the last couple of years, and which left us short right now. So that's where we're a little nervous right now. So, I mean, if people don't like dogs, I don't recommend guard dogs because unless you are just got a real small piece of property with, you know, an occasional, you know, infringement um i wouldn't recommend guard dogs you know unless you really like to run them and to me they're the my favorite animal on the whole property because they're just so intuitive and you know we don't have just wolves and coyotes we have overhead raptors that come in um so eagles are not the issue but um crows believe it or not crows will come in during lambing time and just rip on on the lambs and uh, the dogs won't let them land. So they'll actually, like, a, if you have even a big a horned owls are wicked. They're one of the worst that, you know, if you really want to see something go nuts. I mean, horned owls will attack a 45-pound lamb and then land with their talons. So that, that is another depredation we had. We had a horned owl land with their talons and poke the horn buds. And then they, they want to eat out the brains. And... Um, we had a dog stop that attack, but, you know, they have to learn to listen for a very silent predator. So that was a new one that the dogs had to learn, but they, they figured it out. So, wow. Well, yeah. I, uh, I hope no one was mid bite on that one, but I, uh, I do, <laughs> um, I appreciate, and I had a real aha moment that I took note on was that, you know, you mentioned sort of a, a ratio to, you know, having a lot of dogs. I, I think in my mind, I typically think of livestock guardian dogs as maybe one or two, like you oh, mentioned. Oh, no. Versus yeah, you go to, how yeah. many you might you got when, when we were in Spain, we'd see these flocks of, you know, one or 2,000 sheep. And as they came past you, you see these dogs bopping up and down inside the flock as they're walking past the, the dog head popping up. And so we figured, I think there, they were running one dog for every, like, maybe 80 to 100 sheep. And that was on a big plains area um, where it's easier. Like, we have a lot of places for predators to hide. And there they could see for, for a long distance. But they, you know, they were really, matter of fact, he said, this is livestock. The dogs are livestock. They love the dogs. They respect the dogs. But you have to take the mental note of looking at them as livestock. And um, people need to wrap their head around that instead of thinking of having a bunch of little yap dogs around. That's it's a totally different beast. These are these are some pretty cool animals. So, But they need to be run properly. So. I, I think, you know, what's interesting about the two perspectives this evening is just trying to match your you know, your needs to the actual, you know, preventative measure that fits for what you need. And right. like you mentioned, like guard dogs may not be the right fit for every farm or every farmer. And just like Brad said, it might be a, a, a troubleshooting combination of a scare right. radio and uh, an electric, you know, sort of scare wire and different things. So right. it's and I've had people call me and they're in the middle of a, you know, a depredation issues. And the first thing we tell them is to bring the livestock in and night pen them. You know, you've got to get the issue under control. You can't just go out and grab dogs and throw dogs at the problem. You know, it's, it's a scenario that you have to work into. So like with us, we'd have a heck of a time fencing our property because of the terrain. So fencing isn't really an issue for us. I mean, not, not feasible for us. So, um, you know, different strokes for different folks, right? But the whole main point is non-lethal. You know, and if, if people learn to not be scared of the wolves and learn about the wolves, 
and the other predators. Uh, that's half the issue right there is the education, like Brad had talked about, educating people like when they need to really be paying attention, you know, so. Yeah. yeah, the other thing to remember, too, is, you know, most producers rotationally graze, you know, so they're constantly moving animals around a different right. pasture. So, yeah, you might put up flagery or a fence in one location, but they still want to pasture in other locations as well. So, yeah, you, you got to tailor your abatement to an individual producer and, and their operation. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that. I, I'll just ask um, Mary if you have any final words and Brad, I'll ask you and then we'll I'll wrap it up and we'll call it a night. Is there well, anything else you wanted to add? I, I just want to add that I, I think, you know, non-lethal is the way to go. Um, we live, you know, I go fat tire biking just four miles from here at the Fish Lake Flowage and I've had wolves run out in front of me after deer. Um, People ask me, aren't you afraid of the wolves? I said, I'm afraid of my neighbor's dogs going after me on the bike, but not the wolves. You know, the, the wolves um, have left me alone. I really enjoy watching the wolves. Um, I want love of all the wildlife here. But, you know, we made the commitment to that. And um, I think so much of it could be prevented just through education and um like it's going back to what Brad said, you know, you need, it's for some people it's a combination of things, but I guess I'm probably preaching to the choir when I said it just totally galls me when I he, hear people just grabbing the gun and they're going to take care of the issue because it's like saying, I'm going to go out and shoot a deer. I'm going to stop the deer from reproducing in Northern Wisconsin. You know, they just keep coming. <laughs> you know, it's just going to keep coming. So it's just like a coexistence, I think is the biggest thing that we need to do. Just, you know, educate and make the effort. Yeah, and from my perspective, you know, I, I hope um, everyone learned about some of the things that we're doing. I, I think there's, um, you know, it's not well known, you know, there. I think there's a perception that, you know, we go right to lethal control. And, and that's not true. You know, right now, one, you know, wolves are are endangered in the state and, and we don't have lethal control authority everything right now is non-lethal but even when we do have lethal control you know we, we have an integrated program that tries to utilize these non-lethal abatement, abatement techniques when we can you know and and, and as we learn more and, and as we deal um, you know with chronic issues on farms we're exploring more long-term permanent solutions to, to wolf issues you know unfortunately it's it's at a cost of eight to nine dollars a linear foot with this fencing but it does work you know on on some of these farms um, so yeah one you know I hope folks understand or, or you know, um, are more aware of, of the techniques and, and tools that we're using to try to um, minimize some of the con conflicts that we're seeing. Um, but two, I hope uh, folks understand that we do have a program that provides these services. So if someone is having wolf conflicts, um, you know, call USDA Wildlife Services so we can verify, you know, that it's wolves and, and that we can provide some assistance, you know, whether it's fox lights or flagery or, or you know, some type of fencing, um, you know, we do provide services. Um, and we do try to, to reduce or minimize those conflicts that you see um, or, or that people experience. So, um, yeah, there, there is the ability to for coexistence, um, you know, from the department, we, we feel that an integrated program utilizing both lethal and non-lethal is, is the best approach. And, um, you know, we're committed to, to utilizing these non-lethal techniques when we can. I, I would just like to see some of that grant money going towards... Um... Uh, incorporating livestock guarding dogs on a long-term basis, like through consult consulting um, services available and, you know, supporting purchasing of the dogs even. Uh, I know the state of Minnesota did that. They have a preventative program fund and it not only pays for placing the dogs, it also pays for consulting fees and for veterinary care. So I'd love to be able to see Wisconsin do something like that. Yeah, we just a couple weeks ago had actually, well, probably a month ago, had a meeting with, um, or, or we engage with Minnesota DNR, our wildlife services, pretty regular to to see what they're doing. I know they were also um, trying some things to, to with uh, livestock carcass um, composting and and you know fencing that off so it's inaccessible to to predators and things like that. So yeah, we we do work with Minnesota Wildlife Services to 
bounce ideas off each other and, and see what, um, you know, what we can do to improve programs in both states. So, um, yeah, yeah you, and you we're hopeful we can get a grant program at some point established here. You did make a really important note. You talked about the carcass removal. You know, nobody can afford to remove downstock now. So that's what, one of the big problems is the downstock being dragged out to the woods and left there, and then they're actually baiting the predators in. And that's, I know, that's rampant in our area. So it'd be nice to be able to figure out how to, you know, solve that problem. Yeah, yeah, rendering's a challenge. Um, a few years ago, we did host a, a workshop um, where we partnered with Department of Ag, Wisconsin Department of Ag, and had an individual come and talk about composting, you know, as an individual that was um, knowledgeable and, and um, an expert in the field of composting to, to try to find those alternative ways right. to, to get rid of carcasses. Yeah. And yeah, that's leaving everything on a nice note. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the wealth of knowledge and certainly everything. I um, I think it's so important that we we understand the options and then we be be mindful and be working toward helping yeah. fund some of these things. So I right. uh, definitely appreciate it. And um, uh, I want to thank you both tremendously. I know that the group here... Um, you know, weathered some technical storms here with us. And thank you. Um, I know many more people are going to be catching the recording as well. So uh, just in the spirit of the education being important, thank you very much for that. And um, with that, I'll wrap us up here quick. I'll just say uh, two quick reminders in regards to our overall Wolf Awareness Week. Um, first, if you haven't taken action yet, uh, our Take Action Tuesday is, uh, the clock is ticking on that. It's uh, really urgent. If you are looking to speak to the Natural Resource Board next week on the October 25th meeting, we have uh, a, an important blog and an action, a pre-drafted email for you at our website. So Elizabeth, if you're out there and able to pop that in the chat, I certainly appreciate that. The, the clock is ticking. So that's super important. Um, and then next up tomorrow night at seven o'clock, we're going to try our hand again at a Zoom meeting, and uh, we're doing a throwback Thursday, but it's in the spirit of looking at the Endangered Species Act 50 years uh, this year. It was signed into law in 1973, believe it or not. And so we're going to have a couple of our national experts from the Sierra Club that focus on this, and uh, Bonnie Rice and Bradley Williams, uh, Bradley based out of D.C., talk kind of the past, present, and future uh, Endangered Species Act and how it relates to gray wolves. It's certainly been uh, a tool for their recovery. There's been a lot of back and forth that has created some confusion. And I know there's a lot of angst right now as we wait for an update from U.S. Fish and Wildlife early next year. And so we're going to be pressing them. I'm going to ask them some of the tough questions about what they think is going to happen to the Great Lakes uh, wolf population uh, as we move forward. So uh, with that, Elizabeth, if you can throw the chat in there, um, the link to sign up for that Zoom meeting. We appreciate it again, seven o'clock tomorrow, Thursday, throwback Thursday. And uh, I just hope we see you tomorrow night. And I want to say thank you again for hanging in there with us tonight. I really do appreciate it. I think education is paramount and the awareness is what we're really focusing on this week. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. We'll say good night. Good night. Bye. Bye now.